Our sovereign Lord and our God, we thank you and we honor you this morning, acknowledging your presence, acknowledging all that you are, acknowledging your faithfulness and your wisdom, even Lord, your leadership. We come before you to worship you, to have communion with you, to listen to you. May you speak to our lives, may you minister to us in your own special way, through your son Jesus by the Holy Spirit. We commit this gathering before you and pray that may your grace be upon each one of us. Through your son Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. At this moment in time, I would like to invite Mrs. Lungwebungu, who will lead us into the psalm reading. The psalm reading this morning is coming from uh, the book of Psalm, Psalm number 58. Verse 1 to 11. Psalm 58, verse 1 to 11. Good morning, Noah Christ. Good morning. Um, Psalm reading from Psalm 58. The Bible reads Do you rulers indeed speak justly? Do you judge uprightly among men? No, in your heart you devise injustice and your hands met out violence on the earth. Even from birth, the wicked go astray. From the womb, they are wayward and speak lies. Their venom is like the venom of a snake, like that of a cobra that has stopped its ears. That will not heed the tune of the charmer, however skillful the enchanter may be. Break the teeth in their mouths, O God. Tear out, O Lord, the fangs of the lions. Let them vanish like water that flows away. When they draw the bow, let their arrows be blunted. Like a slug melting away as it moves along, like a stillborn child, may they not see the sun. Before your pots can feel the heat of the thorns, Whether they be green or dry, the wicked will be swept away. The righteous will be glad when they are avenged, when they bathe their feet in the blood of the wicked. Then men will say, surely the righteous still are rewarded. Surely there is a God who judges the earth. The word of the Lord. Uh, Thank you so much. At this time, I would like to invite Ms. Dutch Pasha, who will lead us into the prayer of intercession. Let's put our hands together as we are coming. Amen. Amen. Shall we bow our heads and pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, we say thank you this morning. We say thank you for your love. We say thank you for your kindness even for the peace that you've given us. Jehovah God, as your word has spoken, we come before you this morning, knowing too well that for us to live is because of you. For in you we live, in you we walk, in you we have our being consistent. Therefore, we live this day before you to say, Oh God, may you bless us through. Even as we pray for our leaders in the name of Jesus Christ. We follow the ways of Paul, who said that make every effort to make sure that the bonds of peace and unity abide. So we pray for the peace. So we pray for the unity among our leaders at the national level and at our university. For we know too well that Jehovah God, where there is peace, there is unity. And where there is unity, there you dwell, O God. We know that in all fullness, that where there is the Spirit of God again, there is liberty. I pray in the name of Jesus for the Son of the living God, that may we unite in the name of Jesus for the Son of the living God. Father, as the word I've spoken in the name of Jesus Christ, that if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, seek my first, turn away from their wicked ways, then shall I hear from heaven, and I'll come down and heal their land. In the name of Jesus Christ, Father, I pray as we humble ourselves before you, that may you come down for the healing of our land, for the healing of our cities, in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Father, as your word I've spoken that in the last days I shall pour down my spirit upon all the fresh. Young men shall see vision. They shall dream dreams. Old people shall dream, shall dream dreams. In the name of Jesus Christ. And it shall come to pass that whoever that shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Father, we thank you for your presence. Father, we thank you for the revival in our land. Father, we thank you for the great works that you have done and that which you are doing in our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ. So I live the coming week before you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Being the example, week, I pray for our students. In the name of Jesus Christ. That Jehovah God, through the Holy Spirit who searches the deeper things, even the deeper things of Christ. I pray, oh God, that the Spirit shall bring to remembrance whatever that they have made, whatever that they have studied, whatever that they have discussed, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Father, we thank you. For I know that whoever calls upon your name shall never be disappointed. Neither shall they be disappointed. Father, I believe in you. For in you we have all we need. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor, all the power, and all the majesty. Continue being with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Mr. Tupasha. Uh, choir, are we ready? Okay, let's put our hands together as we will come. Our choir will be like... <laughs>
love us the way that Jesus loves us for. He came and he died for us to save our sins, save us from our sins. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to sing that every praise belongs to our God. He's worthy of every praise. If you're happy to be in this place, if you're happy that you're alive today, that you have life, now is the time when we're going to praise the Lord. Amen.
Lord, there's none that can be compared unto you, Heavenly Father. We've searched the whole world, Heavenly Father, and we can't find no one like you. Heavenly Father, we pray that even as we are about to begin this weekend, Heavenly Father, you may be with us, mighty Lord, and you may protect us. Thank you for being our shepherd, Heavenly Father. Mighty Lord, we can't do anything without you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we declare, Heavenly Father, that through you we can do everything in the mighty name of Jesus. And we give this coming, the coming week into your hands in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, Heavenly Father, you will start with us, mighty Lord, even as we are about to begin our quizzes. That mighty Lord, you alone may help us. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray a heart full of thanks. Amen. At this moment in time, I would love to introduce the preacher for this morning, who is going to lead us into uh, breaking of the bread of life. And this is Mr. Chapo Mbetwa, Mr. Mbetwa. Let's put our hands together for our preacher. I am blessed because I'm alive. So count it a joy that you are here today, that you are hearing the word of God. Count it a joy that you are part of the North Rise community. Um, I, I don't take my standing here uh, uh, without a, a regard. I feel deeply honored uh, that I was given the privilege to come and uh, share with the, uh, the, the, the North Rise uh, University community the word of God. And uh, my prayer today is that as you listen to what God has to say to us, my prayer is that God will reach out into your heart and touch you, that you will open your heart and receive this word as a word that is specifically for you today. So that is my prayer, and may the Lord bless uh, this discussion that we are going to have. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you, God, for who he is and for what he will do. All right. Let's uh, get into what uh, we need to talk about uh, today. As you are aware, a authorized community, we've been discussing uh, from the book of Romans for quite some time now. The book of Romans was written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome. And he wanted to exhort them even as he was preparing to go to Rome and visit them. And this letter was actually addressed to both the Jews and the Gentiles in Rome at that particular time. And he brought out this letter because there were certain uh, disputings that were going on in the church as to how one would get saved, how one would access the salvation of God. Uh, Paul labored in the book of Romans to present a salvation that is born out of God's love for man and his desire for men everywhere to be saved. And that's why today the title of this discussion is the universality of God's salvation. So Paul labored to actually present the gospel that uh, he presented. He clearly explained that the fellowship that has been broken between God and man is as a result of sin in us human beings. Sin that we committed against God both as individuals as well as the human race. We are all aware, uh, most probably, what happened in the Garden of Eden and how we fell from, from glory. 
and uh, God made the way. He made uh, a salvation to us by sending his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, that whosoever believeth in him should be saved. And this salvation is available by faith in Jesus Christ. And in this disposition further, Paul makes it very clear that there are eternal consequences for all those that do not receive this truth, for all those that reject this truth, there are eternal consequences that will be uh, given on the day of God's wrath for all who reject this truth. And one thing that is also very clear in this portion, in this discussion by Paul, is that the things that need to be known about God is clear to all that all men are without excuse. So we cannot give an excuse that we had no opportunity to hear the word of God, to know about God, especially us who are gathered here and are in the hearing of my voice. We have no excuse whatsoever not to put our faith in Christ. The scripture reading that we are looking at is coming from Romans chapter 10. If you would quickly turn there, I'll, I'll, I'll go before you. It's, it starts from verse 12, but uh, I'll start from verse 9 to give it context. Okay, so the Bible reads, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. He is the same Lord. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it, writ as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The salvation of God is available for all of us and we can and we must be saved and there is responsibilities that are involved in this process. Firstly, to those that are going to receive this word and find salvation, and also to those that are already in the fort, have believed in Jesus Christ, they have a responsibility to go out there because Christ sends us to go into the world and preach the gospel. Verse 16. But not all Israel accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. There will be us who will receive the word today, and we will not turn it into reality by not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, just as it was in those days. Verse 18, but I ask, 
did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Again I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses said, I'll make you envious by those who are, who are not a nation. I'll make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. It is not me who chose Christ first. Christ chose me. It is not me who loved Christ first. Christ loved me first. Whilst I was yet a sinner, he sent his son. He sent his son for you, for me, to die for us, that when we believe, we can find this salvation. Verse 20. And Isaiah boldly said, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, O oh, dear Lord, I have held my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. God will always extend his hands to those he has chosen, but you must work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So what are we saying in this particular uh, portion of scripture we have said? God has made a way for all of us, if we believe in Jesus Christ, to be saved. It is God's desire that each one of us that are in this room and everyone else should actually come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And Paul, like I've already said, emphasized that this salvation that we're talking about is not by what you have done, is not by where you are coming from, is not by your ethnicity, color of your skin. It is nothing about who you are and what you have done. It is all because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. And it is not because we are clever than anyone. Because the Bible declares us to have all sinned and have come short of the glory of God. We are all saved by grace. In Romans chapter 1 verse 16 to 17 and in Romans chapter 2 verse 8 to 11, these truths are clearly stated. I'll read for you. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. There is no works. It is a righteousness that is by faith in Jesus from beginning to end. That is the righteousness that God has given us. Just as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. But for those in Romans 2 verse 8 who are self-seeking, who reject the truth and follow evil, they are self-seeking, they reject the truth, and they follow evil. For those who are self-seeking, self-centered, ego is what rules their lives. They reject the truth and continue to follow evil. There will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. So you see in here that the judgment of God is on all. It doesn't show any partiality. If you do not really accept the truth and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, 
you will suffer the consequences irrespective of who you are, what people called you, and where you come from. But if you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will be given glory, honor, and peace. It doesn't matter who you are, what they call you, or where you have come from. God wants all of us, all men, to be saved. He wants all of us to come to the saving knowledge of Christ. And he has actually prepared a way for you and me to be able to approach the throne of grace and find salvation in God. In Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, that desire for God is plainly put. For God, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, says the Holy Scriptures. And who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth? God wants you, wants me, wants your friend to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. But now, in Romans chapter 3, verse 21 to 23, the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. The emphasis that I make today is that the grace of God is available for us to move into a position where we will be partakers of the heavenly kingdom. You don't need to do anything. All you need to do is to place your faith in God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's what the scripture says. What this therefore means is that in Christ, God the Father accomplished and made it possible for all to turn to God and be partakers of this righteousness. When Christ was dying on the cross, he was taking your sins. I am sure most of us have watched the movie called The Passion of Christ. And uh, they depict Christ being beaten and all the things that they did to him. But I want to tell you today that what was depicted there is not even reaching the level that Christ suffered to be able to win you, to make it possible for you and me to give to be his children. The Bible says he was beaten beyond human recognition. Why? Because he needed you, he needed me to come to the saving knowledge of Christ. And when he was on the cross, he announced it is finished. Meaning the work that he did on the cross was enough, was efficacious. It is able to do that which God has intended for everyone who will bless their faith in God. You do not need to do anything like I have said. You need to trust in the work that God accomplished in Christ on the cross of Calvary. And when you do that, you will find the way to Christ. That's why it is declared very strongly by Christ himself that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, Jesus died and accomplished what needed to be accomplished. He who was without sin became sin that we might live in him. He became flesh and dwelt among us. He who was God from the beginning has always been God, who will always be God to the end of time. But he came and died for us. And I would resonate with David and ask, Oh God, why are you so mindful of man? 
But I understand and see in the scripture, it is God's love for man as he wants to commune with you. It is not like God can exist, can fail to exist if you are not there. God is the self-existent, the eternal and almighty God. And yet he desires a fellowship, a relationship with you. And he has provided a way for you, for me to get to him. Therefore, I put it to you. If you do not have Jesus in this house today, you are walking on the wrong way. It does not matter which way you are walking on. You are on the wrong way. That route is leading you to eternal damnation, eternal separation. Like I always emphasize, it won't matter when you die what they will write on your grave. May his soul rest in peace, whatever, whatever. It doesn't matter how many you receive on your Facebook war, Instagram war. People say, may your soul rest in peace. If you did not know Christ, whilst you are here on earth, you are done. There is no peace for the wicked, says the Lord. That is what God says. So, don't get comforted that they will write. And don't get comforted that your father, your mother, your vice chancellor uh, is, a, is a believer and therefore will be saved. Each man shall stand before God on their own account. There is nothing like being saved corporate. You can be going to church every day, but on that day you will say, God, I did not know you. So I put it to you. If you have no Jesus, you are on the wrong way. The Jesus who must dwell in your heart and be the Lord and ruler in your life. If you do not have Jesus, you are living a lie like I've already said. Because there is an appointed time where you will have to face the truth. And the truth is only found in Jesus. If you are not in Christ, you do not have Jesus. The Bible says you are dead in your sins, dead in sin and trespass. The only response you can, you can never make response to anything that is good. And the only thing that awaits you is eternal damnation. But God has made the way for us to be able to approach him and to come to, to him. Now, the, there are questions that can arise, especially with educated people like ourselves. We can conceptualize, we can put what you go when you are doing your, your thesis, hypo, whatever. We can put all those things, and then we can reach a conclusion and say, Christianity is for only those who don't know how to live their lives. How can you enjoy life if you are a Christian? How can you enjoy life if you can't do ABCD? But I tell you, that is a fallacy. For those who even go and study the word, they just pick out where God says, Esau, I hate it. Jacob, I love that the purpose of God in election may stand. So they will argue and say, me, I cannot be saved. The way I feel, it is like God has not saved me. Because no, God ordains everything. He knows everything from beginning to the end. From the end to the beginning, he knows. So, if I'm not saved, it is God's fault because you have read something in the Holy Scriptures that talks about God selecting those he foreknew for himself. Yes, there is the coordination of God. There is nothing that happens on earth without God knowing. God puts out everything by the power of his word, but he also puts free will in your heart that you will choose which way you are going to walk in. Whether it's a way of death, whether it's a way of life, whether it's a way of obedience 
whether it's a way of disobedience. So I would like to quote for you a, 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 a statement from uh, one Mary F. Anger on coordination and human free will and how these two reconcile. For ordination concerns only God's people. So, for ordination is for those that are already in the fold with God. So far as the human race is concerned, every man may not only accept